Everyone, welcome back to another video. In this video, I want to answer the question, is becoming a pen tester actually worth it? During one of my recent forays into the Reddit universe, I stumbled across a post in the OSCP subreddit on Reddit, basically saying, hey, you think you want to be a pen tester? No, you don't. And here are all the reasons why you don't want to be a pen tester. And so I want to react to it. I want to give you some of my honest thoughts, some of my honest feedback. And if the author of this blog watched this, I just want to be very clear. I am not attacking the person who wrote this blog. I guarantee you this person is an incredible human being. I bet if we met at some point in time, we would get along great, have a lot of things in common. So instead, I'm not attacking the person. Instead, I want to critique the ideas and the logic inside of the blog post and offer a different perspective of someone who is currently a pen tester in the industry. So let's go ahead and do that. Here is my screen, and here is where I stumbled across on Reddit. It was really popular on the OSCP Reddit. So here it is. I'm not a pen tester, and you might not want to be one either. Either. Found this cool blog worth a read. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to literally read this line by line and just give you my honest feedback, my honest thoughts, and answer the question hey, how accurate is this? Should you be a pen tester? Obviously, I am a pen tester, but I'll give you truly raw and real what it's like to be a pen tester and point out parts of this article that are accurate and parts that I would argue aren't quite accurate. So here we go. Let me zoom in so y'all can see it really good, and we'll just go through this. Make sure you can see it. My face isn't blocking it. All right, fantastic. Let's dive into this. Hi, y'all. So this is going to be a different type of post. I've tried to stay a little off the radar personally with my blogs and Twitter account. It's now called X, all right? Elon Musk would be mad. It's now called X. Just kidding. I'm not going to critique that. X is a stupid name. Keep calling it Twitter. For a lot of reasons. It's not hard to find out who I am. I have links to my Twitter account and this blog on my LinkedIn. I know it's a gross place, but I don't flash it around. So I just want to say... Um, once again, to the author of this blog, I don't know who you are. Please don't take this video as a personal attack in any way, shape, or form. This is just my reaction to the ideas. I guarantee you, you're an awesome person. We probably have a lot in common, so I just want to remove the person from this, and I want to talk about the ideas and experiences in this blog. All right, let's keep on going through this. I don't know if I've ever said this before on my blog. I definitely have on Twitter, but I'm not a pen tester. So let's just point that out right now. He's going to go on to say he has some experience in pen testing, but the person, I don't know if it's a male or female, but the person who wrote this blog is not currently a pen tester. So, uh, and I, I'm glad that they're honest about that. A lot of influencers and a lot of content creators will talk about like, Hey, here are all the steps to becoming a pen tester. And then you look up their resume and they've never been a pen tester like ever in their life. So I'm glad that right up front, the author of this blog is honest, like they are not currently a pen tester. Even though security is extremely interesting to me, it's not my day job. I worked as a pen tester for a very short time before leaving the position. So once again, a little more additional context that they provided. We don't know how long a very short time is. Was it a month? Was it three months? Was it six months? Was it one year? I don't know, but they're up front and they are honest about their context and their experience. And I think that's to convey to us, hey, these are my personal thoughts, my personal experience. Maybe it doesn't apply across the board. Why did I leave? I'll get into that later. I haven't been doing security stuff for very long. I think the first time I get cloned something was back in 2018. I didn't get my OSCP until 2020 and I failed twice. So I think we kind of started around the same time, although I'm even newer to the field. I got my OSCP I don't actually remember when I got it. Was that 2022? I think it, or was it 2023? No, 2022. I would have gotten mine in 2022. So this person's actually been in the field quite a bit longer than me. I work as a Linux admin and I have for the majority of my time in IT. Prior to working in IT, I was in the US Armed Services not doing IT. So all of this was and still is very new to me, which also very new to me as well. I'm not a good programmer, neither am I, ChatGPT comes in clutch, or even that great with Linux. I still have to man page most of my job. Uh, I, I have to GPT most of my job, so we're in the same boat there. I'm constantly saying, why doesn't this work, et cetera, et cetera. Oh yeah, the file path comes after the permissions. Why am I talking about this? Well, because even though I don't work in security full time, I still get to play around with malware development, attack pass, and other cool stuff. I just don't get paid for it. The thing is, I'm also not accountable for it. Five years ago, when I started all of this, I really wanted to work in security. And I will say, the, the thing I do like about this 
is everybody wants to work in security. Everybody, it seems like, wants to be a pen tester. You ask the average student in school going for an IT degree, hey, what do you want to be? And they'll say, I want to be an ethical hacker. So let's just be upfront and blunt. Pen testing is not for everyone. I would even argue pen testing is not for most people. So I'll, I'll put that out there. And I'm glad they're also upfront about that. Like really wanted to work in it. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, I don't know. I am not a pen tester. And here is what I wish somebody would have told me before I tried to be one. The job market. Oh my, that I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I know it's a little bit silly, but I'm, I'm, I'm religious. So I'm not actually going to say that. There are 3 million cybersecurity jobs out there that haven't been filled. We've all heard it. And yes, we have heard it. Take a look at where these stats are coming from. A lot of times it is coming from an organization that does what? Offers cybersecurity training. Weird, huh? This is a this is a good call out. I really do think this is good, right? Consider your source. There are a lot of cybersecurity jobs out there, but they're not all entry level. And you know, what criteria are they using to say cybersecurity? And it is a good call. These stats are coming from colleges, universities, certification organizations. It's, they have kind of a uh, I'm trying to think of the right word to use, but they have a reason for advertising all of these jobs because they want you to pay them. We've also heard the debate on what an entry level job in cyber is, which, yeah, they want five years experience and an OSAP for an entry level position. Now that's not bad. Like, let's just once again, be upfront. Pen testing is not an entry level job. Cybersecurity can be like a SOC analyst can be even a, a cybersecurity analyst can be. Pen testing, generally speaking, is not entry level, but that doesn't mean you can't get a, a first job as a pen tester, right? There's, there's no, there shouldn't be gatekeeping. It's not, hey, you have to be in IT support for three years or assist admin before you can be a pen tester. No, you can have your first IT job be a pen testing role. Not super common, but it is possible. But that just means you've grinded it out. You've done a lot of work to get to that point. Who was texting me? Timeout stream. <laughs> My wife just told me overtime. The Super Bowl is now in overtime. How many people do we have watching while the Super Bowl is in overtime? Geez, a lot. So we're at uh, almost 40, almost 40 viewers. During overtime Super Bowl, I think I've surpassed John Hammond at this point. Just kidding, John. You're still way cooler than me, but I'll, I like to pretend. All right, here's the truth. There are ways that you can get an entry-level position in pen testing, like a true entry-level position. That is true. That's what I was just saying. But you have to have some experience. Entry-level doesn't mean no experience. It means some experience. And that's not on Hack the Box or Try Hack Me. Uh, well, kind of true. Web devs, sysadmins, or .NET programmers have an excellent chance of getting scooped up into an internal team. This would be a lateral movement with a company that the candidate is already established in. Don't have your OSCP or whatever cert is the hotness right now. Want to get into pen testing? You probably need a CS degree. Hmm. Do they mean computer science? And you have to pivot into a paid gig off an internship. All right, let me just pause here. Once again, he, uh, this author is sharing their experience. So I will share my experience, but my experience is not true across the board. But when I got my pen testing job, I did not have the OSCP and I did not have a computer science degree. So I'm just going to put that out there. I was hired as an associate pen tester at Rhino Security Labs without the OSCP, without a computer science degree. I did have a bachelor's in cybersecurity though, and some other search like the pen test plus. So just for context, I did have those things, but I did not have the OSCP. I'm, I'm guessing they mean computer science. I did not have a computer science degree. The days of getting your OSCP and instantly having an interview are EY, at, oh, at EY, at the company, are long, long gone. Okay, let me talk about this as well. I had multiple job interviews for pen testing roles before I was hired at Rhino, and once again, before I had the OSCP, I had, I'm going off memory, but I think at least three interviews for pen testing jobs that I applied to. But let me show you uh, a pause here, and I'll show you how I applied for pen testing jobs. I use this Reddit and uh, this information security hiring thread. 
I'm telling you guys, this is an underrated spot when you're looking for cybersecurity roles because it's not like on LinkedIn easy apply, right? Everybody's applying, not everybody is looking at these roles. So I had really good opportunities um, going through some of these roles and reaching out to the people who posted with my background and got interviews pretty often on these four pen testing roles, even without the OSCP. So I just wanna say once again, OSCP, although it's helpful, you don't absolutely need it to be a pen tester. Check out this thread on Reddit NetSec. Getting good with the team and transition over to security. I think he means uh, like getting good, like general IT and then transition. The team is going to know your strengths and weaknesses so they won't be annoyed or feel duped that they hired somebody who can't code the new Pooh Party Pock in NIM. So I'm not saying that's a bad path. I think that's a good idea. If you have a company that allows you to transition over to security, do it. Also, most people in security have egos. Hmm. Ah, that's a strong statement. Most people in general have egos. I don't think people in security have more egos than everybody else. Let's keep reading. Most people in security have egos and feel the need to inject their technical dominance onto everybody online. Chat, is this your experience? I'm curious. It hasn't been my experience. It'll be different talking in person to a mid-level operator that can talk to a hiring manager on your behalf. My experience with security and cyber is that people are actually very open uh, to helping and being honest about even imposter syndrome and things like that. Maybe I'm just talking to the wrong people, but I, honestly, people in security seem to have less egos, at least from my experience, uh, than some other stuff. Okay, Ref Fail over on, on, on YouTube said on tech Twitter, yes. Okay, so maybe that's, that's the difference in context. This person has a Twitter account. I don't use Twitter at all. So just maybe I'm not in um, the Twitter ego verse when it comes to cybersecurity. So I'll just say, yo, if this is you, knock it off. <laughs> Quit being a jerk. If you are smart and uh, are super technical and you come off as a jerk, you're not worth much to an organization, right? Don't be a jerk. It'll be a lot better if you don't have that. Horizon said, I was in management and the others still had egos. Okay, so I'm gonna take back what I'm saying based on chat. It sounds like a lot of people have had the same experience that most people in security have egos and feel the need to inject their technical dominance. Not my experience that people in chat are saying this is their experience. So that means the chances are someone is watching this and you fall into that category. Yo, just quit. You're not that smart. Even if you are that smart, the people you're talking to are smarter than you at a bunch of other things. Don't be a jerk. You're not that awesome. Get in your head. All right, let's go. And like one person, I'm gonna highlight another person in this. One person that's the complete opposite th of this, and I always joke about him, but is John Hammond. All right, John Hammond is an incredibly uh, intelligent person in our industry. And his YouTube videos comes off as very genuine. Ran into him at DEF CON, and he actually recognized me, like he knew my name, and he was the same in person as he is on YouTube. Super genuine, down to earth, uh, doesn't come off with an ego. So be like, be like John Hammond, he's awesome. All right, since we're on the subject of the job market, it's 2024. Have you seen the layoffs? Yes. But how are people starving for talented cyber people when every tech firm is laying people off? I just can't speak to that myself. Um, I thankfully have not been laid off, so I don't know what the job hunt is like for like pen testers who have been laid off looking for pen testing roles. If other people know what that's like, let me know. I just can't speak to that. The job market is hot for cyber people, but cyber people that have 10 years experience as a web app pen tester, client facing consulting experience, CVEs, and have given talks at conferences, they wouldn't have a problem finding a job. I think I'm almost in that category, so maybe I have my own job security built in. Um, I don't have 10 years of experience, but I do web app pen testing. This is like everything else. I am client facing consulting. I have now nine CVEs. My ninth one will be publicly released on Tuesday with a full blog. And I've given talks at conferences. So hopefully if I ever get laid off, I won't have a problem finding a home. Um, well, let's break this down a little bit. I don't know if you need that. Uh, 10 years of experience. Client facing consulting experience. Yeah, that's super helpful especially if you want to be a pen tester. There are internal pen testing teams that I work for a consultancy. I work with clients. CVEs are also huge, but look, CVEs aren't as difficult to find as people think they are. There's this cool guy 
named Tyler Ramsby, who released a video saying, hey, here is how I found eight CVEs in two weeks, right? Watch that video. I guide you through the process. I also heard this cool dude named Tyler did a sit-down interview with Jerry Auger from Simply Cyber and uh, shared his, my experience finding CVEs and practical steps to do that. CVEs are a huge plus to your resume, and they're not as difficult to find as you think they are if you spend some time CVE hunting. They're way easier than bug bounty, I can tell you that. The market is not hot for people that turn off real-time protection to run their NSF payload. I don't really know what that means. As you don't know how to bypass AV or something? I don't know. The market is also hot for web app people. Why? Because if you're worth... We won't say that. At web apps, you're doing bug bounty and making four to five times what a consulting firm is willing to offer. No, you're not. That's just flat out falsehood. Um, let's talk about this a little bit. Bug bounty is incredibly inconsistent. Even if you're an incredible web app pen tester, it's very unlikely you're able to make a full-time living doing bug bounty. We hear those stories, like there's only a few uh, nomsecs. Not, not all of us are gonna be nomsec. Most of us aren't gonna be nomsec. You might be able to make some money. So uh, for me in 2023, I made, I think $2,600 doing bug bounty, which is cool. But that's not get, that's not going to pay my bills, right? Uh, so I don't think you're making four to five times what a consulting firm is willing to offer. That's just that that simply is not true. Full disclosure: I was offered 120k to be a web app person. I didn't take it. I make way more as a sysadmin. Okay, cool. I'm not aware of the global job market. This is just what I've seen in the US. It could be different in other countries. So once again, I wanna point out the humility of the author of this recognizing, hey, I'm viewing this from a limited perspective. I talked to a lot of people in the EU, so they seem to have some openings, but who knows? I do know that pen testers in the UK make far less than they do in the US. I believe that's a true statement. On a side note, have you noticed how many training sites there are now? It's almost like people are making more money teaching hacking than actually doing it. Every time I turn around, I see a new EDR evasion, malware dev, real hacker training course popping up. Strange, huh? I don't know. I think people just enjoy teaching. So, like, from my perspective, I don't make uh, much money at all from this. Let's see. What do I make? I make, I think last time I looked at my YouTube earnings, I make about $50 a month from YouTube, right? So, I'm not getting rich out of this. I just love teaching. I love I love communicating with people and helping people break into into the industry. So I'm not trying to make new training platforms or promote them just because I think they're ripping people off. I think more training platforms are good. Uh, keep making them. I have no issue with that. Consulting. This is me. So you want to be a pen tester. Think you're going to sit down at your Cali box and start P-execing to DA? Just want to point out, I did this exact thing in my last internal pen test, all right? I, I sat down on my Cali box and got domain uh, admin in, in a day. So yes, that is what I think. <laughs> that is what I do. Okay. Have you ever done a kickoff meeting? Absolutely. They're actually a lot of fun um, meeting the clients that you're working with, asking questions and getting to know them. I have done them. I do them all the time. Have you ever been dragged into a sales call? Absolutely. Once again, I enjoy it. I enjoy talking to companies and helping them understand the importance of security, seeing us not as a, uh, a cost center, but rather as a value add. I, I love that kind of thing. Have you ever been expected to bring in clients? I'm not expected to bring in clients, but I do my best to do it just because I'm passionate about what I do. Like I'll say this to anyone, if you're looking for a pen testing firm, the number one is Rhino Security Labs. I would love to hack your company before the bad guys do. So if I can bring in clients, yeah, I would, I'd love to do it. Being expected would be a little bit stressful. I don't I personally don't know of any consultant pen tester who has like an expectation. Hey, this year you have to bring in five clients. I've never heard that being an expectation for pen testers. Welcome to the consulting world. The majority of pen testing jobs you'll find are in the consulting world. The dirty, grimy world of consulting is a hellhole that pen testers find themselves in with no foreseeable way out. Absolutely false. At least from my experience. Um, yo, I love the consulting world. From my experience, being on an internal pen test team and what that means is like you're a pen tester, but you just work for one company and you pen test internal apps. That sounds 
just incredibly boring to me. I'm not saying it is boring. I've never done it. But for me, it sounds boring. I had this issue. You can even look at my LinkedIn where I hopped jobs like every six months when I got into IT because once I learn something, I'm bored. I want to learn something new. What I love about consulting is every single week I'm working with a new app, a new client, a new tech stack. Like I have to constantly learn and dig into stuff. Every single day is new. So I'm just going to say, the, the consulting world is not a dirty, grimy world of consulting hellhole that pen testers find themselves in with no foreseeable way out. It is absolutely not that. Consulting is amazing. And I say that as someone in the industry, consulting. All right. At some firms, the security comes secondary to the money. How much is the client paying? That determines the level effort. I believe turn and burn was a phrase I heard. Okay. Once again, I can't speak for other firms. I've only worked at one pen testing company. I can tell you at Rhino, this is non-existent. We don't treat different clients differently based on what they're paying. Me as a pen tester, unless I like take the time to actually look it up, I have no idea what the client's paying for, for the pen test. So we're not, we don't change our level of effort based on how much money the client is paying. And I guess I'd be surprised if other pen testing consultancies are doing that. I was actually told once they aren't paying that much money, so just do whatever. Sounds legit, right? Well, you worked at a garbage consultancy. All right, I wish they probably can't do this, but name drop whoever this is. Like, if there's a consultancy that that's their attitude, they should not be in pen testing because they make the rest of us look bad. And I will also say this. If you go with the lowest bid for your pen test, don't be surprised when you get what you pay for. If you go for an organization like Rhino Security Labs or Black Hills InfoSec or TCM Security... You're, it's not cheap. You're, it's not the cheapest pen test that you can get because you're paying for quality work. So I'll just say that you pay the, the least amount of money for your pen test. Don't be surprised if you get a garbage pen test, just uh, mark that checklist. That's you get what you pay for. Right? So I guess if you're paying the, the least amount of money you possibly can, that might be the attitude you get, but at legit consultancies, you're not going to get that attitude. A lot of times you'll come away from an engagement, with the client having paid $20,000 to be told to turn off LLMNR. Not my experience. This is the world where a client pays 15,000 for a wireless pen test and the operator runs Wi Wi Fi, doesn't get a handshake and walks away. Sounds great, right? Not my experience. Are all consulting firms like this? No, certainly not. Okay, well, I'm glad you made that plain because they definitely are not. There are some really good ones that actually take the time to work with their clients and secure their networks over months, even years. That is what we do. So, top highlight know what you're getting into if you're interviewing at a consulting firm. Yes. Anywhere, not just pen testing, any place you interview, you should be interviewing them as well. Ask them about billable hours, how many operators are on each engagement, what the reporting requirements are, etc. Also ask them about research, training, development time. How do they treat this? Those are solid questions. So kudos to the author, even if they were only in pen testing for a little bit, solid questions you should ask, but not just about pen testing gigs, anything you do. So let me break this down a little bit. Billable hours are the amount of time you're working with a client. All right. So if I am working like this, this next week, I am on an assessment, right? So all of next week is billable hours for me, but we're not like an MSP. If you've ever worked in an MSP, you have to like sit down and actually track like on a timesheet. Here are the amount of time I work for the client. We don't do that. Like I work for the client for a week, but I'm not tracking my time because a lot of that time is research, looking into stuff. So it's not like really strict on your time. It's not like being at a managed service provider, right? So just know that. How many operators on each engagement? I mean, that kind of matters, but kind of doesn't. Generally speaking, uh, most engagements just have one operator or one pen tester, unless it's a red team engagement. What the reporting requirements are, well, you're going to write a report. Most uh, firms that are good, like Rhino, we have our own internal report writing stuff that helps automate some of the process for us and make incredible reports. Also ask them about research, training, development time. I do think that's important. All right, you don't want all your time to be billable or client facing. You want some downtime for research, training, and development. And I would say, like, I get maybe if we take a month, right? So four weeks, uh, usually at least one of those weeks is for research and development. So I have that built into my role as a pen tester. Obviously, if you're not on client engagement, you're not just sitting around watching Netflix, but what are you doing? For me, I'm finding CVEs. Look at my YouTube channel. Are you editing other people's reports? 
Nope. Developing internal TTPs? Nope. Or do you go from one client to another with no downtime? Nope. I, I have that downtime to research, and at least downtime for me is totally up to me. I can do Port Swigger Academy. I can do Hack the Box Academy. I can do Try Hack Me. I can make a Try Hack Me machine. I can do CVE hunting. Like, whatever I can do to grow my role, I have that full freedom to do during that development time. It really is awesome. Drink of water. I've been talking a lot. What happens when you get stuck on an engagement? You know something is exploitable, but you can't figure it out. This happened to me a lot. It happens to me a lot. But the firm didn't want to bill another operator against a client, so nobody would even take a look at my attack. The client suffered. This is garbage. Not, not the author, but if the consultancy they work for actually did this, this is a garbage uh, consultancy. Just throwing that out there. Here's how it works at a good consultancy, such as Rhino Security Labs. I'm stuck, or I want someone to look over my shoulder, I can ping our senior pen tester with way more experience than me and say, hey, yo, can we jump into a huddle and can we look at this together? And they'll take 30 minutes, maybe an hour, even longer, and they'll jump on the engagement with me and they'll help me go through the engagement. And we're not charging the client anything extra because I pulled on a senior pen tester. Sometimes we'll have like three pen testers helping out with one engagement. We're only charging the client for the one pen tester though. So at least where I work, the environment is, hey, if you need help, feel free to let us know. Other pen testers will jump into the engagement with you, and we'll figure this out together. We'll work as a team. Teamwork makes the dream work. So if your consultancy works for it, has this attitude, yeah, get out of there. I see why this person was only in pen testing for a short time. It sounds like, based on their writing, they work for a pretty uh, terrible pen testing company. So don't work for that company. If you're in that company, I just want you to know there are good companies out there that are not like that. Internal teams are always better. Um, so you always want to be careful about making an absolute statement. You can't say that because you haven't worked with every single team. Uh, so I'm just going to say false logic there. You can't say that. You don't know. There is usually not as much reporting, and if there is a report, it can be tackled by the other team. Or if the team is high speed enough, a staff technical writer. Uh, I actually like reporting, so... <laughs> to each their own, I thoroughly enjoy writing and speaking, obviously, and communicating, and I enjoy writing pen test reports. Now, if you put it off to the end of the engagement, right, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, here's how I do it. When I'm on an engagement, I work from, you know, morning until 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and then for the last hour of every day, so from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., I have it in my calendar reporting. I work on my report one hour at the end of every day, and then on the last day of the engagement, I have an entire day to write the report. Well, guess what? Since I've been working on it every single day, my report's essentially done. I just QA it and get it ready for the client. Reporting isn't as hard as people think it is, as long as you know how to structure your time, but if you wait to the last day to write your report and you suck at taking notes, once again, Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Don't be surprised when you're stressed out. Junior pen testers need to understand how they look to consulting firms. In the world of business, if you're not bringing money into the company, you're costing the company money. Pen testers don't bring in money. Sales what? Pen testers don't bring in money. Salespeople do. I guess. Kind of. The salespeople make the sales, but yo, the pen testers are literally the ones bringing in the money. <laughs> I mean, what? Maybe I'm not understanding what they're saying. Maybe because the sales are client facing first. I don't know. My perspective, yes, the pen testers are the ones who bring in the money. If I don't do a pen test for the client, the client's not going to pay us. Sales can't do the pen test, right? P pen testers bring in the money. I'm just throwing that out there. Pen testers are the company's product. Exactly. Therefore, we bring in money. They sell the pen tester to a client for a specified amount of time. Exactly. They sell the pen tester to a client for a specified amount of time and money. The pen tester is making the money. If you go over that time, you don't cost the client more money. You cost the company more money. Okay. As a pen tester, you're interchangeable with somebody who, with somebody that has just as much skill, but comes at a lower price. Only if you work at a garbage consultancy. Just throwing that out there. And in this job market, there are a lot of highly skilled operators desperate to make their mortgage after Rapid7 gave them the boot. That they won't take a job for 90K so they don't get their house repossessed? Yeah, okay. Yo, 90K is a sweet price anyways. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's because I come from the world of pastoral ministry, but y'all, like, uh, just a few years ago, I was making uh, like thirty to $40,000 a year with a family of four. $90,000 sounds like, like it's raining money on my head right now. All right, unfortunately, because of the rise of offensive security training, there are, unfortunately, hmm, I wouldn't say that. 
there are more hackers out there than ever. Junior or even mid-level pen testers. So let's just give some context. One year ago, I was a junior and associate pen tester. Now I am a mid-level pen tester. So that's my perspective. I am now a career or mid-level pen tester. We'll find it extremely hard to find a gig right now and probably for the foreseeable future. Mm, I doubt it. I hope Rhino Security Labs doesn't uh, fire me or lay me off, but I'll be real with you. If I do, I have healthy savings. I, I have... Uh, Here's some financial advice. I'll just give some financial advice. If you don't have savings built up, you should. So pay off your debt. My financial picture is this. I have no credit card debt. I have no student loans. I paid all those off. All I have is a mortgage. And in my savings account, I have enough money saved up to last an entire year without any type of money. So if I were to get laid off, I think I'm I'm adequately prepared for that. So we just encourage all of you, if possible, make sure you're adding money to savings. Live below your means. I told you just a few years ago, I was making you know thirty to forty thousand dollars. Well, I make a lot more than that now, but I haven't even changed my lifestyle. All my extra money goes to two things. I donated. I give I give away to some a uh, nonprofit specifically in the religious world. I told you I'm, I'm religious. Uh, I'm a Christian in particular. Love Jesus. Love the Bible. If that offends you, don't watch my stream. But my streams aren't religious. I don't talk about religion on my streams. But that's just who I am personally. So I donate some of it, and the rest of it goes to savings. And so I've just been building that up. So I have uh, over a year right now of of what would be my expenses saved up in my bank account. If I were to get laid off, I don't have to panic. And I think he says extremely hard to find a gig right now. Maybe I haven't been laid off myself, but I think with my YouTube channel, Twitch, CVEs I have, I could find another pen testing job pretty quickly. I hope I don't have to find out though. My prediction is that it will only get harder and we'll see people with cyber search trying to make their way into other IT fields like cloud system admin or web app dev. Maybe. You don't know. The salary. Think you're going to make 150 k Think again. I never thought I was going to make that. Senior level pen testers will make really good money. When I was a pen tester, I made 120 k That's really good money. It was 5 k less than I was making as a sysadmin at the time, but I took the job because I wanted to be in security. You read that right, I took a pay cut to get into security. I did too. Right? Um, I've done the same thing. So actually, when I became a pen tester, I've shared this before, I also took a pay cut to become a pen tester, but like I said, I was already living uh, far below my income. And so it wasn't that big of a deal. Matter of fact, you could take my income now. You could slice my income back to $40,000 a year. I'd be fine, right? So live live, live below what you make. But I also took a pay cut to get into security because at the end of the day, if my bills are paid, I don't care. I, I want a job that's not super boring. And uh, I'm a mid-level pen tester. I can tell you this. I don't make one hundred and twenty k. So this dude was getting paid good, right? Uh, I make, uh, just for context, I make a little more than a hundred thousand a year, but I'm not at 120 K. So you're the right. I took a pay to cut, cut to get into security. If you get an offer, it will be between 85 and 120 K. I think that's pretty accurate. That that'll probably be the offer. But once again, yo, 85 K is a sweet salary. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't, maybe this person lives in a super high cost of living. Yo, I live in South Dakota. Everybody here is broke anyway. So 85 K you're making more than like the rest of your community. That is the truth. Might sound decent, but you can make more money as an Azure admin. Probably can, but not as fun. When I transitioned from security back to sysadmin, I made 40K more. Cool. I didn't have to deal with reports, clients, or billable hours. To me, that sounds boring, right? Boring. Cool. You don't have to deal with that. It's a lot more fun to actually deal with it. I have told this to several security people through DMs and had a few say they were seriously thinking of getting out of security because they were working more than 40 hours a week and not making very much money. Okay. When I was working in a, as a pen tester, I did 60 to 65 hour weeks. Once again, you worked at a garbage consultancy. Uh, so me, at least at Rhino, we're very strict about work-life balance. It's 40 hours a week. You don't work more than 40 hours. You don't work weekends. You don't work evenings. You're never on call. I'm kind of a unique unicorn in this that I enjoy doing this. So me personally, if I look at, uh, I stream about 30 hours a week. So I stream, you know, anywhere from five to 10 hours a week and then some coaching stuff. So I probably work maybe 55 to 60 hours a week total between everything I do. Well, that's because I enjoy it. I don't, not just as a pen tester, my actual paid job is a pen tester, 40 hours a week. There's no expectation ever to go beyond that. I felt as if it were silently expected as did other people on the team. I don't feel that this is a reality. No, it's not. All right. Maybe the reality for you. Not the reality for me, and I'm guessing not the reality for people at good pen testing firms. You will not work in nine to five. 
I do work a nine to five. <laughs> security will be your life. I mean, it can be. Security is kind of my life just because I enjoy this. I enjoy talking. I enjoy making content. When you're not on an engagement, you will be expected to go through the new hot course to level up. Nope. You won't be. You'll be expected to get the latest offset cert. Nope. Matter of fact, people at, at Rhino know my feelings on offsec. So others are getting offsec certs. I, I refuse to support offsec. I got the OSCP. I'm not supporting them anymore. Develop novel AMSI bypasses. No, I've never been expected to do that. Literally ever. And whatever. And this is all after hours. No, it's not. All right. So none of this, none of this is true. At least for me. Ever notice how many US based security people tweet after midnight? How, ever knows how many U.S. based security people tend to be working on a Saturday afternoon? Well, I'm working on Sunday during the Super Bowl because football's dumb. But uh, I, it's just because we enjoy it. We're not forced to do it. It's because we enjoy it. There is a big difference there. The skills. Can you program in C? No, I can't. C Sharp? No, I can't. Python? I can script. I can't program. Perl? No. Ruby? No. Nim? No. Rust? No. I can read it. Can you script in Bash, Perl, PowerShell, and VBScript? I can script, kind of, especially with ChatGPT. For a lot of pen testing firms, you'll need to know programming. They'll even give you a programming challenge. No, they won't. Uh, I didn't get one. At all the pen testing interviews I did, I never had a programming challenge. Not once. Matter of fact, they usually say, hey, you don't need to be a programmer. You just need to be able to script some and be able to read code. And now with ChatGPT, it makes it a lot easier. Is programming really necessary for pen testing? I would say no. You should be able to read it. Kind of, it depends. You should understand the basis of programming as you win APIs and C sharp and C. Will you be expected to analyze and exploit and rewrite if necessary? Yes, you will be. No, you won't. <laughs> no matter what the exploit is coded in. Maybe as a principal pen tester doing crazy red team engagements, you will. But generally speaking, no. Pen testers are expected to be experts in everything. No, we're not. We absolutely are not. From .NET programming to Cisco switch configurations to Java deserialization. No, you're not. You're not... You're not expected to be an expert in all that. You're expected to be able to stumble your way through it, but not an expert. What BitLocker bypasses do you know? I don't know any, because I don't think you can actually bypass BitLocker. But once again, it doesn't matter. Have you ever set up a rogue AP? Yeah. Do you know how to set DMARC and SPF for phishing? Yeah, but even if you don't, GPT can. You don't need to know that right off the bat. I'm telling y'all. It's not entry-level knowledge that you need to have. All right, are we almost done? No, we're going to keep going. Here's something. Have you ever set up infrastructure to do war dialing? No, I haven't. This was an actual task I was given. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's something they did in the 80s, and I was asked to do it in 2021. That's weird. I've never been asked that. These are just the technical skills. When you get to the soft skills, there are also a plethora of things that will be expected of you. How about holding your tongue when trying to explain to a CISO that your implant being detected and causing a deconfliction is expected behavior? Okay. When it comes to skills, you'll be expected to either know it by heart or be able to learn it in about 30 minutes. Quick, what's the syntax running secretstep.py? No, you won't. You won't. One of the things we tell pen testers at Rhino is uh, be really good at saying, I don't know, even to clients. You don't want to say to a client, hey, I know this when you don't. Be very quick to say, I don't know, but I'll research and get back to you and then talk to other pen testers and, and Google stuff. The engagements. All right, let's talk about engagements. Here's something that nobody would tell you when you're getting into security. All the cool you learned in your offsec labs or even did on your own, you probably won't be able to actually do it. Yeah, you will. Say goodbye to PowerShell based attacks. Nope, you don't have to say goodbye. They weren't allowed when I was a pen tester. Why? Because it might get detected. So I can already tell you you didn't do pen testing. At least not actual pen testing. All right. There's a difference between pen testing and red team engagements. I've shared this before. Let me talk about it again. Pen testing is time specific. You might only have five days or 10 days to do an internal pen test. You're not worried about being detected during a pen test. You can be as noisy as you want to be because what the client wants is just find all the vulnerabilities in my infrastructure and make it holistic. Find them all. A red team engagement is much longer. Usually a one month, two month, three month, even a six month engagement where you emulate an APT or an advanced persistent threat and you need to be quiet. You don't want to be detected. So in that type of engagement, yes, you need to be quiet. You don't want to get caught. But for 99% of what's an actual pen test, it does not matter if your stuff is noisy. The blue team knows what you're doing. You're not trying to evade them 99% of the time. The whole training day that I did based on power split had to find a different way. Nope. Here's another thing. Got a dope implant. Think you're going to drop EXCs on a target? Think again. I wasn't allowed to drop anything to disk when I was a pen tester. Why? Because I might forget about them and also because they might get detected. Not true for me either. When you drop an implant, just make sure you note it down and you delete it or let the client know about it. Like, truly, I just think this person worked at a pretty terrible um, consulting firm. 
How about the BYVOD AV killer? Ha, huh? okay. You really think your manager is going to let you kill AV on a client target? Once again, guys, in a pen test, the client will literally turn off AV for you. Okay? <laughs> it might blow your mind. But in a pen test, you an internal pen test, if the client gives you like, hey, we want you to use this computer, an internal pen test is generally an assumed breach, and they will turn off AV so you can run your tooling. You don't have to bypass it unless you're doing a red team engagement. And if you do need to bypass it, I have some videos about that. I changed the registry key to turn on RDP for lateral moving to the SQL server once and everybody had a meltdown. Now, they might. You shouldn't be making config changes to a client's environment without the client's permission. That is important. So I'll give you an example. One time I did a golden ticket attack. If you know what that is, it's a pretty sweet attack. But I was working with the client and told the client, I'm going to do it right now. Is this okay? They said, yes. And I said, okay, let's see if your uh, EDR will detect it. I'm going to do it right now. I got the permission before I did it. And then I made sure I deleted all the golden ticket type stuff. So you do need to work closely with the client if you're going to do something like turn on RDP. Obviously, there are tactics that real APTs could use that would be destructive to a client's environment. Well, look, you're a pen tester. You're not a red teamer. Big difference. You're not called to emulate an APT. So the line between adversary emulation and adversary action moves back and forth depending on your TTPs. In some instances, it would be acceptable to change a parameter of a scheduled test to get remote code execution. In other cases, you could really break something. Yep. For instance, some firms are doing simulated ransomware attacks to a segmented client network. But if you're pen testing a prod environment, you do want to be careful what you change. Obviously. What I'm saying is that you're not going to be able to full auto on client networks. No, you, should, you shouldn't be doing that anyways. Many people getting into pen testing don't understand this and think what they did on the CRTO exam will cut the mustard. Your firm will be restrictive, way more restrictive than you might think. Yeah, that's true. That's just part of being a pen tester, but they're not going to fire you if you make a mistake. You'll, you'll learn. The reality of EDR. Another thing that people don't consider is the reality of EDR. EDR, SIM, whatever you want to call it, is getting much more prevalent in client networks. Bro, they'll turn it off for you on a pen test most of the time. Behavior-based detections will take over within the next 10 years due to AI. Getting past these defenses is only to get harder. Don't have to do that unless you're a red teamer. Will there always be a way? Sure, but whether the industry wants to admit it or not, a lot of companies will start dumping yearly or quarterly pen tests after operators stop finding ways to get in. It's assumed breach. An internal pen test is an assumed breach. You don't have to figure out a way to get in. I'm going to start freaking yelling at this microphone. All right. If anyone's been misled by this article, hopefully I'm helping correct this. It's assumed breach. An internal pen test, they will often provide you with an AD account or a computer in their network or VPN access. You don't have to get in. You are in. They give you in access. That's how a pen test works. <sighs> Imagine paying a firm 40K for a red team engagement. At least they use it here. But here it shows me the lack of experience doing pen testing because the author seems to be confusing pen testing with red team engagement. Completely different things. Just to get told that the operators couldn't jump off their initial entry box, which the client provided. CISOs are executives. They want to see value. And a $40,000 NESA scan doesn't offer a whole lot. In fact, being told that the operator couldn't jump off the box is even more reason to dump the pen test. There is something in a... In a red team engagement called de-chaining, which you'll do. So if you're in a red team engagement and you truly are stuck, uh, you can de-chain, which that means is you'll move from the outside perspective to an assumed breach perspective so you can provide better value for the client. All right. So once again, not true. <sighs> get it. Look, I get it. We all want to get paid to pwn. I do get paid to pwn. Best job in the world. The problem is that the business of hacking is much different than offsite proving grounds or hack the box certified whatever networks. I don't know. The hack box certified networks are more secure than some of the client networks I come across. Just saying. If hacking is your dream, go for it. Just be ready for what's going to take. I'm not trying to be discouraging to junior, even mid pen testers, but if I had known what it was going to be like in the real world of hacking, I probably would have just stayed a sysadmin and got for my Red Hat certified engineering cert. I work in progress for the last five years. If you're interested in web apps, Bug Bounty is getting extremely competitive, but still, you're still your own boss, and many people specialize in two to three attacks. You're not going to make a living through Bug Bounty. That's me, Tyler, killing your dreams. You will not make a living doing Bug Bounty. And with that, I leave you to it. Go drop an exe to disk on a client network for me. So, is being a pen tester worth it? 1,000% it is worth it. Is this article accurate? No. I think it might be accurate to their experience, 
But I will say speaking as a pen tester doing this every single day in the industry, this is not an accurate representation of what it's like to be a pen tester in this, you know, hellhole of consulting firms. That's where I'm at. It's beautiful. It is so much fun doing what I do. So if you want to be a pen tester, it is possible to break into the industry. Uh, I actually started work smarter coaching to help you do that. If you're in the work smarter discord, you can schedule, you can schedule a meeting with me and we can talk about a specific plan to help you break into the industry. It's possible to break in. It's possible to enjoy what you do and pen testing really is a good career. So if you found this article and you were discouraged by it, I hope my additional context gave you an idea of what a day in the life of a pen tester is actually like, but Hey, thanks for watching this and I will see y'all in the next one.